Hypothesis testing for population proportion P. When do we typically use proportions? Well, we use them to summarize qualitative information, like the percentage of males in this class, or the percentage of likely voters in Arkansas that are going to vote for Tom Cotton. Also, we use proportions to summarize success and or failure rates, such as he succeeded nine times out of 10, or 90% of the time or she succeeded five times out of six with a success proportion of five sixths. Let's jump into an example so we can learn how to use the hypothesis testing five-step method on proportions. A collection of opinion polls in Arkansas between August of 2013 and February of 2014 showed that of the 4,420 voters likely to vote for one of the top candidates, 2,285 responded that they were going to vote for Republican nominee Tom Cotton rather than Democratic nominee Mark Pryor. Republicans and Democrats alike would be interested in this election race as the Republican Party is threatening to take Senate seats back from the Democrats. Is there sufficient evidence at the 5% level of significance to claim the population proportion of support for Tom Cotton is enough to win? That is, that the population proportion is greater than 50%. Our first step of the hypothesis testing procedure is to identify the statistical hypotheses. In this case, we are asking if there was enough evidence that the population proportion of support for Tom Cotton is greater than 50%. Here we see the alternative hypothesis is that the population proportion P is greater than 0.5, or 50%. Thus, the null hypothesis, or the opposite hypothesis that we are trying to reject, is that the population proportion P is less than or equal to 50%. In step two, we gather the relevant data from the sample in order to carry out the rest of the hypothesis test. In this case, we saw that 2,285 people were going to vote for Republican nominee Tom Cotton. This was out of a total of 4,420 people that were either going to vote for Tom Cotton or Mark Pryor. The level of significance for this test is 5%. The sample proportion is calculated from the x and the n, as you might recall from confidence intervals. In this case, we see that in the sample of 4,420 likely voters, 51.7%, or a proportion of 0.517, planned on voting for Republican candidate Tom Cotton. In step three, we're going to try a new approach today. It's known as the p-valued approach. If you've ever read a research article in your field of study, you may have noticed a p-value. This is where they come from. A p-value is a conditional probability. Given the null hypothesis equality is true, what is the probability that a random sample would have produced statistics at least this extreme? For this example specifically, we ask, given that the true population proportion is 0.5, what is the probability that a sample of 4,420 would have supported Tom Cotton with a sample proportion of at least 51.7%? A p-value essentially says if the null hypothesis were true, what's the probability of getting something this extreme or this weird? If the probability of getting something this extreme is very low, then it could be the null hypothesis was a false conclusion to begin with. So if the p-value is low, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. To calculate a null hypothesis, we first calculate a test statistic. In this case, the test statistic is calculated as a standard normal z test statistic. We take the sample proportion, p-hat, subtract the null hypothesis proportion, and that all happens in the numerator. Then we divide by the square root of the null hypothesis proportion times 1 minus the null hypothesis proportion divided by the sample size. Here to the right, you see that I've entered the numbers from our problem. When you do the math here, you get 2.26 for your test statistic. I urge you to try this on your own calculator and make sure you get the same result. The p-value is then calculated as the probability that a standard normal variable z 
would be greater than the test statistic we just got. It's like saying the probability of getting something as extreme as we just got in the data, given the null hypothesis is actually true. In this case, if we remember how to find standard normal probabilities, we can use our textbooks, and we'll get about 1.2% for our p-value, indicating that if the null hypothesis were true, there's only a 1.2% chance that we would have gotten results from the poll as extreme as this. We can either choose to believe that a miracle has occurred, or we can choose to believe that the null hypothesis was never right to begin with. In this case, we're going to reject the null hypothesis because the probability is too low. Here's why we're going to reject the null hypothesis. In our decision step, step four, we say that if the p-value is less than the significance level, then we reject the null hypothesis, H0. However, if the p-value is greater than the significance level, then the null hypothesis is too plausible to reject. Our p-value of 0 0.012, or 1.2%, is less than 0 0.05, our level of significance. So we must reject the null hypothesis. Our interpretation of these results is that there is sufficient evidence at the 5% level of significance to claim that Tom Cotton has a majority, that is more than 50% of all votes, of those votes going to one of the two top candidates. If you'd like to do this test on your TI-84 calculators, then all you need to do is remember the key information you got from step two. Go to the stat button on your calculator, scroll over to tests, and go to the one prop Z test. It's a one proportion test using a Z distribution. Here we enter the null hypothesis proportion first. In this case, it's 0.5. Notice I've already entered the information from step two. There were 2,285 people that said they would vote for Republican nominee Tom Cotton. There were 4,420 people that said they were going to vote for either of the top two candidates. We wanted to do an upper-tailed test, so we choose the greater than P0 option, and now we calculate. Here we see a test statistic that rounds up to the 2.26 that we saw before, and we see a p-value that rounds to the 0 0.012 that we saw before. At this point, you can skip the math in step three and jump straight to step four and reject the null hypothesis because you can clearly see that the p-value of 0 0.012 is less than the significance level of 5%. Let's quickly go through another example. It is suspected that a six-sided die has been weighted either towards ones or towards sixes. Of 100 total rolls, a six comes up 20 times. Is there enough evidence to suggest the die is weighted for or against sixes? Test at the 5% level of significance. As usual, in our first step, we need to formulate the hypotheses. In this case, we're testing to see if the proportion of sixes differs from what we would expect to get from sixes. We know there are six sides on a typical six-sided die. That makes sense. So we know that there's a one-sixth probability of getting a six if this die is perfectly fair. Thus, our null hypothesis is that the die is still fair, that it has a one-sixth or 16.66666% probability of turning up a six each time it is rolled. The alternative hypothesis is what we're testing for. We're testing to see if there's evidence to suggest the die is weighted. That is, that the die is an unfair die and either comes up sixes too often or comes up sixes not often enough. So we're testing for a difference between what we expect to get from a fair die and what we think we'll get from this die. Again, in step two, we gather data from the random sample, and in this case, we've already sampled a die 100 times. We know that the 20 times the die came up with a six. We roll a total of 100 rolls. We're testing at the 5% level of significance, and our sample proportion is 20 out of 100, or 20% sixes. In step three, we follow the p-valued approach. Our test statistic, a standard normal test statistic, z, has the same equation as in the last example, 
When we plug in the relevant values for this problem, we should get 0.89. I urge you to try this on your own calculators to make sure you come to the same result. To calculate the p-value in this class, not only are we looking for the probability that z is greater than 0.89, we're actually looking for twice that probability since the test was a two-sided test. We find that probability in our z-table using methods from an earlier statistics class. We double it and we get about 0.374 or 37 percent. This is our p-value. Recall from step four that if the p-value is greater than the significance level, then the null hypothesis is too plausible to reject. Our p-value of 0.374 is greater than 0.05, our significance level. So we are unable to reject the null hypothesis. In our interpretation, we say that there is not sufficient evidence at the 5% level of significance to claim that the die is weighted either for or against sixes. In 100 rolls of a fair, unweighted die, it is quite likely, 18.7%, that we would see at least this many sixes, and just as likely that we would see an extreme number of sixes on the lower end, thus creating our 37.4% p-value.